This episode is brought to you by the Denver Art Museum. Grab your friends for an evening of interactive fun at the Denver Art Museum's next Untitled Artist Takeover, happening this Friday, October 25th, from 6 to 10 p.m. Friday's Untitled event features Slam Nuba, a legendary collective of Denver artists bringing their award-winning slam poetry to the dam. Untitled Artist Takeover with Slam Nuba is included with general admission and free for dam members. Reserve your tickets today at denverartmuseum.org. That's denverartmuseum.org. Today on CityCast Denver. It is less than two weeks until Election Day, and the ballot is so long. But don't worry, we've got you covered. We hosted a live event with a sold-out crowd at Town Hall Collaborative on Santa Fe last week and broke down all 12 questions Denver voters will decide, from the sales tax hikes to the slaughterhouse ban. And before we get into it, this will become important later on. Our guest, Deep Singh Badesha, works for DPS, but he appears on our show in his personal capacity, not as a representative of the district. Okay, on with the show. Today is Thursday, October 24th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Hi. Hi. Hi, all of you. Hello. Hi. We, like, put out this little Eventbrite, and we are like, oh, cool, people. Maybe we'll show up. And then all of you were like, yes, we'll be there. And we're so happy you're here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Bree Davies, host of CityCast Denver. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to introduce this awesome panel in a minute. Um, But I want to thank Town Hall Collaborative for hosting us tonight. Can we give them a round of applause? This is an incredible space. Oh, my gosh. This is they host so much cool stuff all year long. And we were just honored to work with them. So um, just again, before we before I introduce these folks, uh, just a little bit on what we're doing tonight. So we're gonna dig into the ballot. And just so you all know, we can't cover every single page of this insane ballot that you're all expected to fill out, but we will be hitting all of the Denver issues. Did anyone bring their ballot tonight to fill it out as we go? Yes. 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 I love that. That's proactive. I like that. I think Um, she has a blue book too. Oh yeah, I saw I was like, I saw somebody back there with a blue book and I was like, look at you. Oh, the Denver White Book, which is half of it's online. That's a whole other scandal. Uh, But so we'll be talking through uh, each of these ballot initiatives that cover Denver. And then um, we're kind of going to dig into what what these all mean for Denver, what we think, how how we think the city is going to vote on it and what we think that says about what are the priorities um, for Denver. So uh, let's get started. Uh, You've already you've already heard about him. Uh, you may know his voice, uh, Paul Caroli, senior producer at CityCast Denver. Hi, Paul. Hi, everyone. Give, it a, give a round of applause for Paul. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And then one of our long-running favorite guests, founder and editor-in-chief of Westward, a person who's been writing about politics here since Denver was like 200 people, some cows, and Mile High Stadium. Out of state. Yeah. Out of state. <laughs> She's technically from... Where are you from? Chicago? Chicago. Okay. That's, that's fine. That's fine. Patty Calhoun, everybody. Hi. Hold on, Deep. Your, your, uh, dis- your uh, bio went on to the next page, so you've got to give me a minute. Um, but he's a returning fave here at CityCast Denver. He grew up here. He's clerked at the Supreme Colorado Supreme Court, worked at the state legislature, among many places, and currently works as a lobbyist and campaign consultant. Um, you might also find him poking people verbally on Twitter at Deep Not Shallow. Deep Singh Badesha, welcome back. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, holding this mic is going to be tricky. I know. It's, you got to get used to it. Um, All right, well, let's just get started. We're going to start at the top of the ballot with the Denver issues. We're going to start with 2Q, which is the Healing Denver campaign, which is a 0.34% sales tax to increase funding for Denver health. So a yes on 2Q would raise the sales tax 3.4 cents on every $10 purchase, uh, infusing Denver health with about $70 million annually. Who wants to jump in? Any thoughts, feelings about... Denver Health and this need for money. This is our safety net hospital, if you aren't familiar with it. It serves a lot of folks across the city. They've got clinics all over the city. It's a vital part of the city. But this is a lot of money. I'll jump in on this one. I think this is the quintessential has Denver changed vote. Mm. Because 
a sales tax for a hospital that is the hospital of last resort for people who can get no help anywhere else, that is the kind of thing Denver would always vote for. Interesting. And I think because we live in the core city, we have to help because you know Aurora isn't. You know Edge. You know, <laughs> the real. others aren't going to. This is where people can get their help. So I think this will pass. You do. I think if it doesn't pass, it's really going to say a lot about Denver. And some of you may know that, so Denver Health actually used to be part of the city of Denver government. Then it became a separate agency during Wellington Webb. And he's pushing this, but you know, it's like Denver housing. It's still really part of Denver. And he's pushing this really hard. And everyone who's pushing this is very pissed off at Johnston for throwing on the other sales tax thing afterwards. Which we will get Because they think to, it yes. could screw up their chances. But I think this is the quintessential Denver vote. Yeah, I think so, too. It, it also has the advantage for being the smaller sales tax that they're asking for right now. So it's a little bit easier to stomach. But I, I don't know. I mean... This one is such a slam dunk. Like, I feel like when people read this, they're going to just be like, yeah, hospital, great. Yes. Um, so I was thinking, what could be the case against this? And we had CEO of Denver Health, Donna Lynn, on our show this week. And she was talking about how Denver Health has expanded all the services they provide. They do so much more than they used to. They provide, like, you know, mental health care services. And then there was one thing that she said that really jumped out at me. She said that they build housing because they've learned that some people need housing support to help keep them from coming back to the hospital. And I was like, do we want our hospital to be providing housing? Don't we have other parts of the government to provide housing? And so I think that's really the question that some people are gonna be answering with this vote is, how much power should the hospital have versus other departments in the government? Well, how much housing are we talking about? That's when I, the just homeless got like yeah. 34 units of apart yeah, temporary a apartment right. It's housing. very small. I mean, to me, that speaks to the dire nature mm -hmm. of, of needing housing. But it's so deep. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Speaking to what you were saying, too, like this does speak to the heart of like Denver's electorate. Denver's a very, very blue, very, very democratic city. And one of the most popular issues for Democrats and liberals for the longest time has been more universal healthcare, providing healthcare to a lot of folks. I think one of the interesting things that this might say about Denver too is the margin is early on when you started hearing about this tax, it was focused on who are these people who don't have um, coverage and it was migrant folks, right? Mm. Undocumented folks didn't have this. And lately, if you've seen all the talk they've done, they've really shifted away from that. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they got polls back, if there was like attacks that happened. It was an interesting shift that they're like, oh no, Denver Health provides all these other services. And it's interesting is that when they explain what the problem was several months ago, it was very about what caused this issue, which right. was an influx of undocumented folks. And now they're like, oh, we need this for everything else too. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because I think that that's something is we characterize it as this hospital that serves the most vulnerable. But I will say also like my brother had like a traumatic life-threatening situation when he was a teenager and Denver Health is a, a level one trauma center and that was the hospital that he went to that saved his life. And so they do serve all these other functions as well. And I think it definitely is what is probably the burden, right? Is Or the, the hardest thing for them is they're providing services for folks without insurance, but folks with insurance can also go there. It's for, it's for anyone. The fundraising on this one's also interesting because it is so wildly lopsided. This campaign for this measure has attracted more money than any other question we're going to talk about tonight, especially from Donna Lynn herself, the CEO, which is interesting because she, she's she been pumping money into this thing for years now since the pandemic started. And she told us she would love to stop. So that's one <laughs> other thing you're going to be voting on is, are we going to start paying for it in sales tax or is she going to be paying for it out of her personal bank account? Um, but, um, but yeah, it's $1.8 million they've raised for this. One of the other big funders is, uh, is Kent Theory, who's obviously pushing the, the open primaries, ranked choice voting thing. Um, CEO of DeVita. But yeah, $1.8 million and then none, zero money donated uh, against. Interesting. Well, let's I think it's a slam dunk. I think it's going to yeah. pass. I think so too. I think I think there's been a couple points made here. It's like it's the smaller of the two taxes that are on here. It's also a hospital. Again, who doesn't want to fund a hospital? But the migrant conversation is really heated up in this state in a in a different way than it has in past years, and that may have something to do with it. We'll see. They, they might have gotten a little bit of a boost because Donald Trump talked about the hospital negatively. That's right. And I, I think it's like, oh, Donald Trump saying don't fund this hospital. I think that might also lean into the partisan. <laughs> it might identity. actually help. I'm like, yeah, no. 
Wouldn't that Screams. be nice? Man. No, I think that's why they were stopping talking about it, though. The point you made earlier, they were like, then we're not talking about the migrants anymore because he got focused on it. But you're right. I think if they if they pushed on it harder, people in this room would probably love it. I think it passes by a 50% margin, 70 yeah. to 20. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is the gambling portion. So if you guys just want to log on to sports betting, your sports betting <laughs> app, just pull that out. Just kidding. This is Deep's wheelhouse, though. He was like, are we going to do margins? And I was like, uh, if you want to. If we disagree on one, we'll write it down and we'll check in a couple per- of weeks. Yeah, and we'll come back after election day and see who won. Perfect. Okay, let's move on to our the Affordable Denver campaign. This is a 0.5% sales tax. Uh, increase to fund Mayor Johnston's affordable housing plan. A yes on 2R would add a five cent tax to every $10 spent to quote, expand and preserve affordable housing for low and middle income families and individuals. It is projected to raise a uh, hundred million dollars annually for the next 40 years. I hope I have that down right. Again, we're talking about another tax that affects everybody. Any thoughts? Patty, how do Denverites feel about taxes right now? Uh, I think this one will also show which direction we're going, but a no vote is not necessar- necessarily that you're a cynical Scrooge. A no vote on this is going to be because you are tired of paying for your sidewalk repair, mm-hmm. because you're tired of paying for your trash pickup that you didn't have to pay for before. That may because not you're have started. tired, right? Uh, you're know, tired of paying <laughs> for regist- uh, residential parking, which you didn't have to pay for before. Um, and so you're going to end, you're tired of paying your big property tax. Affordability in Denver is not just the ability to get into housing. It's to maintain the housing once the you're there. And I think this is one that they needed to, if they really wanted to push it, get it going earlier hmm. so they could explain it better. So it wasn't so vague. And, and it is very, very vague about where the money's the going. The vagueness and I think the late to the game part of it, too. I think people are a little bit concerned with what Johnston's plans are long term. Well, there's no plan. Right. That it's we like can that's... see. And the city council people were surprised. They were at a Boston, some j- junket with city officials. And they found out about it because Mike Johnston announced it on the stage in Boston. And that's how city council people found out about it. Good intentions. <laughs> but I think this one's going down. I that's that's so interesting that you brought in Mike Johnston and all about this. I think this isn't going to say about how Denver's feel about taxes or how Denver feels about affordable housing. I think if you were to go to Denver voters and be like, hey, uh, 0.5% sales tax and we'll wave a magic wand and make all the housing, I think Denverites would say, as long as it's not on a golf course, we'll do it. <laughs> but as I think long as it's a- not an ugly building. Yeah. We'll do it. In we'll my do backyard. It. Yeah. In my backyard. But I think this is a, like, it's basically going to be like a, I don't want to say popularity contest, like a trust fall, right? Yeah. How yes. much do you trust Mike Johnston? How much do you trust city council that's going to do it? I think, you know, he's at the top of a table and he's about to do a trust fall into the city. And I, I think he's betting that folks are like, okay, you know, I'm at the height of my popularity right now, which he is. Uh, if you look at some of the polls that has come out. But I think it's going to also come down to what's happening in your neighborhood. Are you, do you have an SOS site or I can't remember what they're called now, but like, do you have one of those and you don't like it? Like the things that are very visible about what his housing plan has produced so far, I think could have an effect on how folks feel about it. Paul? We got to talk about how the fact this is a regressive tax. You know, they intentionally chose not to make this a property tax, which is how this is funded in a lot of other places. And that's that's not like typically a Democratic thing to do. And I was I was uh, sitting in on the Denver Democrats meeting last month when they were deciding their endorsements. Bless your soul. I know it was. (laughs) He had a great time. It was lively uh, Saturdays. Love all those people. Hope they keep talking to me. Um, But they uh, they were debating this and this one was so short. They were they all supported it. But the only person who, who got up and explained it, they were like, "It's yes, it's a regressive tax, but here in Denver, we have carve-outs for essential goods. You don't have to pay sales tax on really important things like food and, and health care costs. And I, I don't know all the details, but there's a million other things that you don't, which means that if you're someone who's making $50,000 a year and struggling like hell to live here, you're going to be burdened by this tax way, way, way more than rich people who maybe own multiple properties or, you know, are making those big six figure jobs. Like, I I don't understand how that part of this conversation hasn't been a bigger feature and why people aren't talking about that. Cause it's so unfair. Like it's going to make the affordability problem worse for a lot of people. Maybe not a lot, 
but worse. I think the counter argument here is it's a regressive tax, but the benefits of it go to low-income people the most, right? So even though the income disproportionately, they're like they'll get disproportionately the benefits. So I think I've heard that argument before. Maybe not on that Saturday, but you know, it was so weird. It was like this is the Democratic Party. Why aren't we talking about this? We're going to take from poor people to give to even more poor people. That's our policy. Like, okay. They did defang some of the opposition, right? So we bring this back to like another housing project that was voted on. They had a lot of different baggage on the golf course. Um, that also <laughs> Why had. Why are you trying to bring Deep, up? Do you want to talk about the pro- golf course? The problem no. no. That we already I, did like what? 16 shows on the golf course. Forever haunting you. For, it is really in the back of my mind. Um, it'd be hilarious if they use this money to then develop that place. And then we'll, Penfield we'll Tate just pops out be behind funny. the wall. I wonder if no, they could. No, I was going to say, is it. Um, that would be like under the rules that we know now that they've announced for like how this tax would work. They could so, use the money to buy the. Anyway, go on, go on. Go on. Yeah, <laughs> so, if, if that rumor starts, it's going to probably not pass. But I was going to say, they've <laughs> defanged the opposition here. Uh, I feel like the folks who would have been opposing this, organizing the ballots against this, um, you know, the Working Families Party came out neutral for this. Uh, DSA came out neutral for this. Yimby came out yes for this. So a lot of the organizations that are like sending you mail, doing the voter contacts, are either for it or neutral. So there's not really an oppositional campaign. No, and the money is the money aligns with the money aligns with that too. It's one point three million dollars has been raised for none against, none against. But I do I do still think people look at these guides and it tells you something about what people are thinking if they're remaining neutral on affordable an affordable housing tax, which is one of the biggest issues we know in the city of the last two decades. They're going to be sitting at their kitchen table, looking at the guides, looking at their bills. Yeah, and it could be that'll influence them how much they're suddenly paying. I'm also thinking about sometimes we'll, like there's there's two similar um, initiatives here where we're looking at a tax for housing and a ta- tax for health uh, services. We may go one way on each of them very differently. And I'll be curious to see, I think, again, this will speak to Denver's priorities. We'll see. Um, well, let's move on uh, to, let's see. Well, we're not doing margins on that one. Oh, sorry. Deep, would you like to do your margins? 55% pass. Fifty-five percent pass. I think it's. I think it's gonna be closer, but I think it's gonna pass too. What do you think, Paul? Fifty-one. 52. I need a number. That's where I think it is. Okay. Fifty-two. Fifty-two. Pass. Fifty-five. Patty. I think the it's going right. down. Oh, it's going down. Wow. I think it's going down. You do. I, oh, I'm going on the Johnston popularity you heard it here contest, first, folks. Yeah. This is gonna be a hot one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this ballot is so spicy, but not um, by much. Okay. But it's enough. <laughs> enough okay. that you'll owe me a beer. You're well, on. let's go to a, a way less spicy topic. A what? Oh, you want to pull the audience? I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, how do you all feel? Okay. Who yeah, are yeah. the yeses? Give us a shout for a yes. Who's yes if on the affordable housing the... tax? I feel like people oh, are afraid. Wow. Now, now they're like, I don't the know. Uh, <laughs> someone going to judge me? Let's keep okay. going. Let's yeah, keep going. Good. Okay. Leave us a voicemail. 720 <laughs> If anyone has a strong opinion... Call in. Send me Wait, a tweet. Just send us a voicemail anyway. We just like we really like them. So okay, uh, this is a less interesting one, and maybe a, a more vague one. It's two S. Turn the city and county of Denver's human rights office into a full cabinet agency. A yes on two S would mean amending the city charter to add the agency of human rights and community partnerships as a cabinet department and define the powers and duties of the department. Denverite uh, said that this off this would give the office quote more influence and more stable funding as part of the mayor's inner circle of advisors. Um, Paul, I feel like when we were researching today, you were like, I can't even find a website. Yeah, I just for this Googled thing. it. Where is this office? <laughs> Where is it? Does anyone I, know it? I, I, yeah, I have to be Does honest with you. I don't know what office? to do with this one. Does anyone know anyone that works it? Like, with you, you all are involved in this stuff. <laughs> I don't know where this is. Show your face. Tell us. And this is going to be a cabinet position, maybe. I I'm, guess I don't know what it is. Patty, you, sure, you, it's been please, going forever. Tell us. Okay. Um, so they do a lot of the events. The human, the um, human rights has been a big issue for 20, sure. 30 years. It just hasn't been cabinet level. But I'm a little more concerned about all the other things we don't know what they do. So I'm all about defining what their role is. So and you especially, think this will add some clarity. It won't hurt. I mean, I think we also are seeing that there's a very, very inner circle that is making decisions on a city level. We'd like to see a little more transparency from these departments. Maybe we'll get it. And maybe with a cabinet administrator at table with this cabinet. Okay, interesting. Deep. Any thoughts? Yeah, I feel like this is going to be a pretty easy one. I think it's probably going to pass. There's no opposition to it. 
it sounds like good. Denver voters were arguing like, oh, no, yeah, human, no rights. human rights. Forget Department? that. No. Absolutely not. But it'll be interesting to see. I'm very interested in this and a couple other ones just for the heat map. Like, which neighborhoods are disproportionately mm. against human rights? Which ones are for it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, all I'm thinking about is Aurora right now. That's all well, I'm I think about. also bureaucracy. I mean, we've got the office of the storyteller in the city. There are plenty Did of... A, oh, just, yeah. They Didn't they get rid of that? They did, yeah. But is, is the really office in the still there? This year? I yeah. Patty's heard. been talking about this for years. There's an office of the Denver office of storytelling. I met with them about doing podcast stuff a few years ago. Yeah. They were not interested. They're not um, cabinet level, let's be honest. They're not cabinet but. level, okay. <laughs> what do they do? That is the question. Hmm. Um, okay. I think it's going to pass, too. You think, think it's going to pass? Easy one. Well, this will pass. Okay. Did, Deep, did you make any predictions on this hot one? This is going to pass by 75%. Wow, okay. All right, I like it. Paul, did you want to be the contrarian here? No, that's here? fine. Okay. No, that's fine. I don't know. All yeah. right. Um, okay. <laughs> Gosh, this one also weird. 2T, remove citizenship requirements for police and fire jobs. So a yes on 2T would mean, again, amending the city charter to allow non-U.S. citizens to become Denver police and firefighters would not change any hiring standards that already exist, like background checks, age and education requirements, and physical and mental health tests. So this would just allow for more folks to apply for these jobs. To me, this seems like a slam dunk too, but also I don't know Some it involves the police. I don't know. What do you guys think? It's interesting. I was talking to a lot of progressive folks, right? So, like, I'm, uh, I've been part of the abolitionist community, the community that's really for criminal justice reform. What does the future look like um, it, when you, like, have a different model of community safety? Some of those folks are like, you know, yeah, Im immigrants should maybe be uh, firefighters, but maybe not cops in terms of we don't want to keep funneling folks into that. So there is some opposition on the Funneling the right. folks into the law enforcement yeah. world is what you're saying. So okay. I've heard opposition on the left for this before, and yeah. I've heard some opposition from the right, of course. The Denver GOP came out and said no to this. And it was going to... What's that, two people? Yes. All, <laughs> all two people in Cherry Creek. We should, we should talk about that, too. But I looked at the numbers. Twitter is going viral right now. So on Twitter, nationally, it's been picked up. Because they're like, oh, look, uh, Denver oh. is trying to hire folks to be cops. Oh, so God. I wonder if it's going to get into that right-wing ecosystem. Oh, but I think it passes. TikTok. This might be an interesting map again. Because as you know, like a lot of the law enforcement community lives in southwest Denver. Sure. And it's going to be really interesting how they vote on it. Hmm. I think they'll be for it. I think I, the police support it. You know, our, our chief of police supports it. Mayor Johnson supports it. There's no organized opposition, no money spent on either side of this one. Um, we all know that the police are understaffed relative to their authorized force. I know that's controversial, but uh, that's been a popular issue in Denver for a long time. People want the, the police to be, that's been a Mayor Johnston's position when he was running on the campaign. Um, I think people are going to vote for this. Yeah, I think the deeper issue you were talking about where it's like this, should we funnel people into a system that we fundamentally think is broken, but also don't we want representation from all communities if we're going to be sending police into neighborhoods and like how we know undocumented folks obviously don't feel comfortable when crimes are committed against them to call the police. Will that change that? I can see where that would be like a battle, but I, I don't think it's necessarily going to play out here. I think most voters will think much more. We need more representation of different people rather than they should be working somewhere else Doing other than other law enforcement. Thing. Okay. 60%. 60, okay. <laughs> Paul? <laughs> that sounds fine to me. I hope you're writing this down. I, mean, I need I'll let, you I'll to disagree <laughs> to make this interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I think it's going to go down. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. No, I Thanks. don't. I think it's going to pass. Come on. <laughs> we'll disagree on the other ones later. Okay. Uh, to you, hot topic in Denver right now, collective bargaining rights for more city employees. So a yes on to you would again mean amending the city charter to allow the city of Denver, city of Denver employees, uh, collective bargaining rights on issues like wages, benefits, promotions, hours, working conditions, and more. Um, currently only Denver police, firefighters, and sheriff's deputies have collective bargaining rights and uh, employees of the city of Denver and labor organizers have advocated for this measure directly. City council voted unanimously with approval of the mayor to move forward with this measure. Deep, what do you think? I think this one's going to pass. Um, I think there's the, the interesting political discussions that went to you happened before it even got on the ballot because there was a group of folks who were trying to uh, do a citizen's initiative just to go to the city. And then there was another argument like, no, let's just see if the city council and the mayor's office can kind of do it. So they did a bunch of, I don't want to say backroom negotiations, but like 
city council. It was sort of back room. <laughs> back office. Sometimes yeah. backroom deals are good, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. They changed those open meetings. I'm meeting against lots. backroom deals, for the record. Here's Just for the record, I'm against it. I want to know. <laughs> well, don't so, worry, Paul. They tried and it didn't work. So I think Go a on. lot of the folks that were like either going to be, uh, that could have been against this or didn't think it, I think a lot of those details got ironed out in that process. And that's why it got referred unanimously through city council with the mayor's support as well. So I think that's probably going to be a yes. Patty, you've you've watched the city for a long time. We've been this conversation around uh, collective bargaining and unionizing is happening all across the city in all kinds of industries. What do you think this says about Denver at the moment? It's happening at Casa Bonita. Yes, yes. this will. That's the real. Yeah. Let's switch topics. That's, We're going to move once on you know to that, Casa Bonita. What we all want to hear about. Everyone will be in gorilla suits. Yes, at, uh, just don't touch them in the gorilla suits. Yeah. No, I think it will pass. I, what I haven't figured out is what happens to career service authority. Mm-hmm. You know, the, all those arcane rules, but we'll worry about that later. You know, which has run it for personnel. You know, I didn't actually look into this measure that carefully, but uh, are city agencies included too? So would like the Denver Zoo get unionized? Hmm. I don't believe I saw that in the research I did, but I could be wrong. I know it was, I, I, I would guess not because I feel like they said it was like around 7,000 employees. Hmm. And I don't think that that would include that. You know, I don't think it would spread that far, but that's an I was just trying question. to tie health, no. I was just trying to tie Pop in with quiz. Casa Bonita. Oh. The, but it's not going to work. I'm sorry. I dropped your joke. I'm sorry. Paul, did you? Sorry, Here's did you the numbers. Uh, the money raised for $329,000, none against. All the money raised for is from unions, which is interesting because no one else is supporting it. As popular as unions are, the Kent theories of the world are not jumping in on this one. Well, but I, th- I think the most interesting thing about this is the fact that the mayor says he's for it. And he would be the person that would be like most, I mean, I guess the taxpayer, but the most impacted for by it because he'll be negotiating on the other side. I feel like did we ask him about? I feel like yeah, we asked, we asked him, him about, about it. He told us on our show. He said he wants to do it the right way. That's right. That's what he Mike's, said. All, Mike Mike's always had a really answer. good AFL CIO record and a good union record. Um, there was some stuff with education that he bumped heads with with the teachers unions, but in general, the, the other unions and him and then his pretty amenable to his me. deputy chief of staff is Dominic Moreno, who's pretty tight. He was a Senate Majority Leader um, oh, right. for the Senate who's also tight with unions. So I think a lot of folks knew that they had allies in the office. This would have looked so very would different if Kelly Bruff was mayor. Oh, don't say that name. Just kidding. Just kidding. I'm not saying anything about that. I just don't want to talk about that election ever again. Uh, did you guys want to do some numbers? Did you have any uh, thoughts Six, on margins? 65. 65 pass? 65 pass. Was that what you had too deep? You That was a I'm going to do reaction. like two thirds, so 67. Okay. Okay. Ooh. Patty, you got a number? Oh. That's so radical. I'll do 66. Okay, I hope someone is writing this down. Hot stuff. You heard it first. (laughs) This episode is brought to you by the Denver Public Library. The Denver Public Library is working to create welcoming spaces where all are free to explore and connect. Libraries are one of the few places in Denver where people from all backgrounds and circumstances are welcome free of charge. Since 1956, Denver Central Library has played a vital role in providing access to transformative resources and information for all Denver residents. Which is why on Sunday, November 3rd, the Denver Public Library invites you to come celebrate the grand reopening of the Denver Central Library. You'll experience a renewed sense of wonder as you explore six floors of redesigned spaces like the new children's library and the one-of-a-kind teen space. Enjoy live entertainment, refreshments, giveaways, and more. RSVP is encouraged at denlib.org slash celebrate. That's D-E-N-L-I-B dot O-R-G slash celebrate. This episode is brought to you by Financial Times. When it comes to voicing or acting on our opinions, why are some people more confident than others? With the Financial Times, you form your own opinions with conviction based on unbiased and trusted reporting. FT journalists tackle global issues with an impartial and rigorous mindset, providing the facts and analysis that you need to make up your own mind. Make up your own mind with Financial Times. Visit ft.com slash the journal to read free articles and subscribe. Okay, uh, we're going to have, oh, this is another unions question. 2V, change rules for how the city negotiates with the firefighters union. Okay, I have to be honest with you. This one is 
sounds so complicated. Uh, the League of Women Voters actually gave the best explanation that I could find. Quote, current policy gives members of the fire department all the rights of labor other than the right to strike or conduct a work stoppage, slowdown, or mass absenteeism. Instead of allowing firefighters to strike to resolve impasses in negotiations, Denver firefighters and the city and county have used advisory panels with costs shared by the city and the firefighters. The request with this is to change to a system of binding arbitration, and it comes from the Denver firefighters. The measure would align firefighter contracts with those of the Denver police and Denver deputy sheriffs. This, so we're all feeling the same way about this one. Okay. Yeah, binding good. arbitration doesn't sound good, but this was brought forth by the firefighters, so I'm assuming this is something to streamline, make it easier, make it more affordable. It's, a, it's a big thing in uh, labor union contracts. Okay. Um, it's a way to actually have resolutions. Okay, so it's a a good thing ultimately from the union perspective. And to perspective. bring it on par with the other safety departments makes sense. To bring them all to the same, using the same. Right. Why idea. punish the nice, cute firefighters? The ni- I know. We all need adult. Paul. Paul, you're going to pull out your. I'm not going to talk about it. I got a request for data in until I see the numbers. I have nothing to say about this. Paul's got nothing a real hot take on firefighting. Nothing controversial to say about this whatsoever. I'm going to okay. go with this. I think this might be one of the biggest ones. I'm going to go 78%. 78% pass. People love firefighters. Paul, in the um, Republic of Paul, how is Paul voting on this? Just kidding. Oh, I'm, I'm not. not I, I don't know. I, my only prediction on this is reveal. that the vote total will be low. I think this is one of the ones people will care about the least. Like they just will skip it on yes. their ballot because it is yes. long and Big convoluted undervote. and yeah. has a lot of weird words. And yeah, an undervote. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. 2W, change in how salaries for elected officials are approved. I think this one is kind of interesting. Uh, currently, city council is required to vote on raises for themselves. What an awesome position. <laughs> you know what I should get paid? <laughs> Let me decide. Um, plus, the mayor, auditor, and clerk and recorder every four years in a municipal election, a yes vote would make those pay raises automatic every four years. So um, city council members were concerned about the perception of council members setting their own salaries, and that's who brought this uh, measure forward. Patty... This has obviously been happening for a long time. What does this say about what's happening in council right now? Well, they actually realize it's it's not a good look. On the other look. hand, I'm not sure the automatic raises is really going to play that well with people who haven't seen raises for a while either. So I think this could go either way. I, I don't know what to think about this one. I don't know how people are <laughs> going to interpret this. I don't really even understand the effects. I was reading voter guides for this one from Denver, from Axios. They were all saying different things. I don't know how I'm going to vote. I have no idea. I think there's going to be some undervote here too, but it'll be interesting. Sorry. We were talking about how 2R, the affordable housing question, was like sort of approved. Like, do you believe in Mike Johnson? Do you believe in the city council? Do you trust them with $100 million for affordable housing? And 2W then is also like, do you also think they deserve a raise? Yeah. So I wonder if folks are like, I, the, the the difference between 2R and 2W, which feel like a lot of trust, that'll be an interesting metric to look at. Um, I think 2W, it's going to be on the line because I don't feel like people want to give elected officials salary. No, increases. absolutely not. No, gosh, no. <laughs> they, I mean, they but, but here's something that we do want is someone like Mike Johnston, he could go work for his friend Reed Hoffman and get a salary 10 times as big as he's paying. We want them to get, you know, we want it to be worthwhile for great people. This is a problem we're having on the RTD board right now that we've been talking about. The salary is like $12,000 a year. Yeah, it's not a full-time job, but like all the people that have been on the board, they're like, they're not that engaged. They're not that involved. And the the CEO, Deborah Johnson, treats them as a rubber stamp and they just don't, they're not experts. You know, we need great people to do these jobs. That's yeah, one and thing. city council. I mean, city council is a tough job. You're handling a lot of things all day, every day. I, I feel like every city council person we talk to is never off. They're always on, and so I do find this to be an interesting conundrum we're in. Though is like, yeah, it seems real weird that you get to decide your own salary, but also this automatic raise. I don't know how that's going to play with voters. To be honest with you, I can't tell. I was trying to look up the exact salary. I couldn't find the grid, but I think the mayor is going to go up like 15k put them at like 215 or so. Yeah. Council mm-hmm. was going to go be in like the low 100 thousands. Um, and then officers will make a little bit more than that. So mm. if, if that table was on the ballot, I don't think it would pass. <laughs> if we could actually see the numbers, like what they're getting paid. What's the right oh, number for the mayor? What's the right number? 
Who could say? <laughs> Ask a philosopher. Let's I mean, move on. it's just like we all, I, I mean, at least for me, when I see these things, I think about what I make and what people in my community and my family make and how I, that makes me think about like, is this person worth it? Who's doing this leadership? Are, are they doing the job? I'm, I was hoping they would when I elected them. I don't know. It is a really interesting thing when we start talking about the salaries of people we elected. It's been a problem since the whole country started. Alexander Hamilton wrote a, one of the fed <laughs> two, four, a approved 475 minutes. Yes. Wait, Should we talk DPS? Wait, did we, wait, did we do, we did, did we do margins oh, on the that? Margin. On Where, 2W? Jeez, Paul. Sorry. Some margin. Sorry. It only gets 48%. Oh, you think and it's, it fails? You think it's going to fail? Oh, okay. Uh, all right, yeah, I'll take the other side. I think it'll pass. Do you I have a percentage, Paul? No, I think it'll pass. He's saying it'll fail. I'm saying it'll pass. What do you think, Patty? I think the automatic raise, it's going to go down. I mean, that okay. city council people mm. used to just be paid part time and they had all That's these other crazy. crazy side jobs 20, 30 years ago. And I just don't think people want automatic raises for their elected officials who are already earning over 100. That's so wild. It's pegged to inflation, though, right? Like, they, they did this for the minimum wage, too. Like, this is what vote, we, we think this is fair already. There's like a formula. That, I think if you well, they're had a minimum wage. If you had a ballot measure, like a citizens' initiative ballot measure that said city council and the mayor must make minimum wage, that passes by 80%. <laughs> put that on the ballot. What do we need, 9,000 signatures? Let's put that on Let's the do ballot. Let's do it. We'll start here today. Mike Johnson's not going to run for mayor, though. <laughs> Surprise. That's actually what you're here for. We're launching a new campaign. Okay. Um, 4A, approve a $975 million bond for DPS without raising taxes to fund school improvements. A yes on 4A approves a $975 million bond, which DPS says will go to maintenance of school buildings, fixing things like plumbing, electrical, heating issues, and air conditioning in schools, which so many schools still don't have, which is bananas to me. Um, the Denver Post says DPS officials have said that taxes will not increase if the bond passes because older debt is getting paid off, freeing up repayment capacity. Um, I was, was it the Denver Gazette that ran that bonkers opinion about this that were like, I would love to talk about that. Could you, do you uh, I, I just like, I, I, I don't know. We, we were like, who doesn't want to take care of schools? Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Denver I was looking Gazette's. for, where's the argument against this? It's in the Denver Gazette. They ran an editorial. They said, <laughs> we hate crazy. this. Um, and it's all basically boils down to spite. Um, they don't like the way DPS has been run. They don't like all the drama on the DPS board the last few years. And they feel like a vote against this would be a continuation of the kind of resentment and spite towards those board members and the current administration it's under Dr. Marrero um, that we already saw pushback against last year. So, you know, a lot of that feeling still exists. I drive up Monaco, I see those road signs, fire Dr. Marrero. Not a lot of them, but some of them. So, you know, there's going to be some people. It's a weird conclusion to draw. It's like, this is about maintenance of schools. It's not about like salaries for the superintendent or I don't know. I just, that's what I took from that, uh, that op-ed. I was like, what are you saying? These it's, are not the same thing. I it's mean, a lot of money. It's a lot of money to trust people with. And it, it, yes, they say there's no new taxes, but it still could go wrong. It's still going to have consequences just because we're not paying for it in taxes. But anyway, Deep, I want to hear your side on this. because And oh, also, you, oh, and yes, also a disclosure. Dis yeah. My you. favorite part of the show, a disclosure. A disclosure. The disclosure is I work for Denver Public Schools. You need to leave like right now. Which everyone actually uh, – so Denver Public Schools, people love their school system. People love their teachers. People like a lot of things about it just to throw that out there. So with that disclaimer out of the way, I think it's going to pass uh, for sure. And – they have the magic words in the ballot. So some folks have their ballots in front of them and they'll see that, you know, when it comes to the sales taxes because of Tabor, it says, shall their sa shall taxes increase by some huge number to do X, Y, Z, right? This ballot initiative starts off with the words, with no new taxes. And I think people won't read the rest of it and they'll be like, whatever. <laughs> Sounds good to me. But Denver Public Schools was actually really <laughs> responsible with their money. Right, So the reason that they can raise $975 million to do all this maintenance efforts is because they were really responsible with um, the previous bonds they did. They were able to pay them off, did the maintenance they did, did it on time, and that's why they're able to do it with no new taxes. And we'll get AC in schools, we'll have safer environments, great things overall. I know, I'm like, am I the only one up here that's a product of DPS? Did you go to DPS? Okay. I was a DPS teacher. Those buildings, 
definitely need some help. My friend Yo. in the front row here was a DPS product, then DPS teacher. Look at you, hey, friend. Round, round of applause for a DPS Thank teacher, you. everybody. That's great. That's great. For real. I have a lot of friends that are teachers. It's a tough job. I can't imagine. I mean, just I'm just air conditioning alone feels like enough of a sell to me. Please let these kids and these teachers have air conditioning. Patty. Well, the, tell time, us the, truth. the timing is <laughs> tell us the truth. The timing is very lucky because we're not going to find out until November seventh. Oh, which the school schools closures. might be closed. So that is really, really lucky on this. And coincidence? I don't know. But, <laughs> I mean, Marrero and his office, did anyone else report it besides the Gazette? You know, his $100,000 office renovation. And I he think did a $100,000 office renovation? What? Yes. Like where he works, his that? office? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I missed that. What did All he right. do? Deep, uh, have you seen this office? I deep, believe it, I believe deep, deep my, can't talk uh, about this. My desk is right outside that office. It's, it's, it's. Oh, he did, he, <gasps> he wanted to drown him out, I guess. No, no, no. no some think, of it's soundproofing. I, I think that article <laughs> was blown out of proportion. Okay. It was okay. a regular maintenance <laughs> of offices that you do. We're booking an interview with Marrero about the closures when he publishes the list. Now I want to do it at his office. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, I want to talk about the closures, though, because I think this is an interesting point. Like you said, Patty, it's not till after the election that they're going to announce the, the schools on the list. And then there will be the, quote, like community sessions and then they will make the decision. They have to vote within two weeks. Which so they announce like it on the 7th, then about the board votes on the 21st. Like, so that everyone who voted for the bond issue will probably want to turn around and change it. But I do think it'll pass because this is another Denver Goodwill. We like yeah. our schools for the most part. We might have hated the old board and the dysfunction there. We might not like the new fa fancy office. Maybe you got a new one too. But um, <laughs> did you? Did it, you? No, it's a cubicle. Okay, but a really nice cubicle lined with fur. <laughs> no, while for you a, still can for a band. lined with fur. I know. I was like, we're not there yet. Yeah, not All there right. yet. I, I think this one's gonna pass. I think 60, 60 percent. Uh, Sixty-five is what I'm saying. Really, fifty-five. Okay. Yeah. Right, we and, got uh, again, I will say Denver Public Schools did a really thorough. You all put me in the spot here now. Um, I think they did a really good job in terms of community engagement. Right. They had everyone from the business community to the unions um, to parents groups to students to get to this measure. Is to that get what you're to saying? this measure, yeah. right? So they came to the community with three billion dollars of needs, and the community is the one who decided um, which which ones to prioritize. So, yeah, okay. passes sixty five percent. Okay. Um, next one is 6A downtown, Denver Downtown Development Authority bond. Congratulations. No one in this room probably gets to vote on it. Uh, but we're going to talk about that anyway. You know how many people do? 1,954. Yeah. People will be voting on this. people are going to decide on the future of downtown. Yes. You two live downtown, so maybe <gasps> you'll get to vote on it. You just told me earlier. Okay, you need to come up here and tell us. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Not to put you on the spot. No, this is really interesting, though, because this is, like you said, Paul, this could shape a big portion of downtown, and it's these less than 2,000 voters that are making this decision. So the... Um, the development authority is asking the city to borrow $570 million for public space improvements and big development and infrastructure projects. Uh, interesting to me was Axios pointed out that this would include funding for both public and private projects. Um, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around this, but understanding that this is like how we get things like the renovation at Union Station, right, Patty? Is these tax districts and funding these public-private Things. Right. So this is basically an extension of that and an expansion of that. So it's not just Union Station originally is what got the money, but now it's going to go all the way, I think, to about the Capitol because I think our yeah, office a, is in it's it. It's a much bigger yeah. swath of downtown. I mean, I, I wish I felt better about where they want to, how they'll decide where the money goes. Like, will we suddenly have busker corners with really nice furniture there. I mean, you can't really tell. I None of the money that. that's been, well, that would be the best use of money downtown in a long time, I, I think. Love that. But I do think we need help downtown. So the question is, who will really, do, who will make the cho choices on it? But it's not going to come out of your pocket. Yeah, but I also have this feeling about like the Union Station project itself is so fraught to me because it is this beautiful space. I used to work downtown when it was not that and it was incredible, but there's also this tension around who can be there and who is this space for and is it really a public space? And that's the kind of thing I think about when I think about the renovation of a downtown. Mm. Paul? I don't know. I think this one's going to pass. It passes. Yeah. 
Huge undervote. Passes. 300 people vote. <laughs> 672 people vote yes. Uh, the, 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 key, the key endorsement came out, I think it was today. It was the Downtown Denver Partnership. They represent all these businesses. A lot of these people probably of work for these city. businesses. I think that's going to be, that's the deciding factor. I think this decision's already been made and they know it's going to pass. Yeah, that's a good point, Paul. Okay. Um, 7A. This is one of our favorite topics here at CityCast Denver, RTD. Allow RTD to keep revenue that would otherwise go back to taxpayers. So RTD wants to keep all tax revenue that usually goes back to Coloradans via TABOR. Some folks are calling this a debrucing in reference to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights author, Doug Bruce. If it passes, RTD could see 50 to $60 million annually. Um, the debrucing aspect of this is interesting to me. Patty, can you explain a little bit, like, what is I, the too long didn't read version of Tabor and Doug Bruce and why we're in this position with something like yeah. this? I'll see what I can do. All okay. right. So in 1992, Colorado astounded itself by passing Doug Bruce. If anyone's ever seen Doug Bruce, cranky slumlord. guy who cool slumlord, guy. Denver slumlord, who put this on. Um, so basically, some of it makes sense. Like, it, you have to put, if you want to put a tax up, it can't be done by just government officials. You have to take it to the voters. I think we all like that. The other problem, though, is that if there is excess tax collected, you have to also vote whether or not that goes back to the voters or whether the government can keep it. So in a, that's why you have all these Tabra votes. I think with this one with the RTD, unlike DPS, where with all your fancy new offices, people don't know, they don't care that much. But I think with RTD, this could come to a, be a really big spite vote. I like anyone who's been stuck on a bus or waiting for a bus, anyone who's been on light rail going five miles an hour. The RTD mm -hmm. PR problem. Yes. They, and they have a problem. Yeah, I mean a big That's problem. An interesting. I thing. think, think people would vote against it solely because of their experience. Give me my money because I'm going to have to buy gas for my car because I don't want to take RTD. I, I think there's going to be a spite vote, but I do think RTD is popular enough. I think, I mean, Colorado with Polling home. Institute with Denverites. Colorado Polling Institute found last year 54 percent of Denverites have a favorable view of RTD. That was last year. Well, yeah, I mean, the last year we had the slowdowns downtown because of the construction. I think what's going to be interesting here is like. I think Denver, if it was Denver only, Denver City and County, it would probably pass. But RTD has a lot of outside areas with it, um, including more conservative areas. And because of that, it will probably pass. This is the number one question folks have been texting me about. They're like, what's 7A about? Cause really? There's like nothing you can research about. Yeah. And then if you research it, it's about deep bruising. I know you say Tabor and everybody's like. Yeah. Yeah. So. I would say vote yes on this because it's good to get more tax <laughs> revenue for buses, but I, it's going to be close. I think it'll be very close. Yeah, I think it'll be close too. Probably another undervote. 50.5. Yeah. I know. I think this is going to be like the ones when people don't know what to do with judges. They'll just do a big no. I don't like Tabor. There's I mean, I don't like RTD. I think it should pass because we need we need yeah, a competent RTD is what we need. Yeah, it's, but you've got to have money. It's the weird thing with Tabor, though, where people are like, this tax money is important to us. It goes to these things. But also, I could use that check to, you know, take care of my car problem or, what, you know, like pay rent for one month or whatever it, it would cover. So, I, I, yeah, I'm curious to see how the RTD spite factor gets into this one. Uh, I was going to say let's get into the juicy ones, but that's really gross when I mention what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Measure 308, ban the sale, distribution, and trade of fur products within city limits. This ban would prohibit businesses from making or selling fur products in the city. Um, the Denver Post also says, quote, this measure would also ban sales of cowboy hats if they're made of beaver, rabbit, or hair hides. And it could also ban certain fly fishing flies if they include animal fibers. So all of you hunting enthusiasts... I want to hear from you right now. No, um, this is this is an animal rights one. We're talking about two in a row that are really about this animal welfare issue. I think I where did I don't know where do you where do you, what do you all think about this one when it comes to Denver? I think that's the interesting part to me. Is this Patty is in this, this is in Denver? I know stock show enthusiast well, Patty Calhoun. Yes, that's true. And also, mind your own business, I think, is where this is going to come in. Like, if someone wants to go buy a felt hat, I haven't seen a lot of people I know, wearing I was like fur trying coats to think on like the streets of Davy Denver. I like Crockett hat so, wandering around like, 
who, who but, is you know, this ad? They've gotten very smart about how they're fighting it, which is the felt cowboy hats and the fly fishing, those little, um, you know, if, if they use twine from some elk gut or something. I don't even know how it works. But a lot of it is mind your own business. We don't need to be micromanaged that much. And I, I don't think they've done much of a campaign. They came late into it, like National Western, you've done all the money. But the money has come in to fight it. But I also don't like the feeling that, I mean, I love that we can do citizen initiatives. And that if you have an idea in the city of Denver, and you can find enough people who will sign your petition, sure. you can get it on a ballot. What I hate about this is, it doesn't really feel like it's coming from Denver. It's coming outside. Yeah, I have to say, I'm just not, sh I can't picture how this is going to play for Denver. If it was a statewide thing, I think it would be a different conversation, but. Passed in Boulder, but I think oh, it, it will Boulder. not okay. pass here. You, you think it will not? Okay. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's interesting. Glendale should have secretly been sponsoring this, <laughs> you know. Just, when you cross into Glendale, it's just a bunch of, like, first Listen, stores. my favorite Target is in Glendale. <laughs> That's true. Thank you very that, much. That Target's going to open up its own, like, cowboy hat section, you know. I it's wish secretly they would. bankrolled by that Target. So it's interesting. So they actually did the same kind of scheme that they did uh, for fur bands in California. So West Hollywood first had a fur band, huh. then it was Berkeley, then I think it was like LA, and then they did a statewide band. So, so is it like a temperature gauge of like yeah. how, okay. So then all of California banned fur. And it, you know, there's exclusions, there's limitations, and then a lot of European countries have also banned fur. So, you know, I think a couple of years ago, you all might remember how there was like a couple liquor initiatives and wine initiatives. Like there's three of them on the ballot. I think Denver voters and Colorado voters like to split the baby. They're like, yeah, we'll give you these two and totally. but not this one. Or we'll give you this one because I feel bad, but not this one. So this one paired up with the slaughterhouse ban. I think one of them passes and the other one doesn't pass. That's and a really I think good what's point. going to happen is people are going to be like, ah, you know, I eat meat. But I don't wear fur, so sure, man, that. Yeah, I can wear a different so, kind of hat. You can make it out of something else. Who owns a cowboy hat in here? Nobody. No. Oh. Not this crowd. Here's, here's the money. Well, you're all fired from Colorado. Please leave. But they all want the right to buy a cowboy hat. <laughs> so that'll be part of the independence from issue. From Glendale. Glendale's going to become the hot spot to buy fur coats. <laughs> well, the your, mayor did get out of that fur. ethics fine. Oh, my God. Mayor Donovan, what a guy. So happy for him. Come on, CityCast, Mayor Donovan. Please. Um, the money on this one is so interesting. And the, the comparison with the Slaughterhouse one, too, it's changed a lot in the last month. Um, so the Slaughterhouse went, the one has gotten really lopsided, but this one is still pretty tight. There's $368,000 been raised against the, the, the fur ban that comes from mostly stock show people, people on the board of the stock show, livestock association people. Also, $10,000 from Pete Coors. Not sure what his interest is. In he's, he's got an the outfit he's on the board. Oh, yeah, maintain. he's the big okay. fundraiser for the stock show. He needs show. to look stock like a cowboy. People. It's stock important. Show people. No, I think the stock show part is interesting, though, Paul, because that's like the commerce around the stock show. I mean, we went to the stock show last year. There's tons of this stuff. It's part of the. And you wouldn't and be able like to sell any like, of this it. This is part the of the stock culture. Show. Yeah. Would this, would this real, that would probably really mess up the stock show. I mean, why, it could have an impact on their donations to this. Right, right. I think they're speaking but with like, their money there. What would it be like if you can't sell fur at the stock show? It, it'll be interesting. This is statutory, so you technically could carve out things, right? The the pro animal future people, I think they said that they would be willing to carve out fishing lures and carve out those things. Maybe there is, maybe it passes, and if it passes by a small margin, there's a discussion of being like. There's a two-day holiday. For I know. Fur. I was just going to say, there's one week where you can buy every kind of fur you ever this, wanted. But this you week only in Denver. <laughs> only in Denver. It's like the Tanner Gun Show, but yeah. That's, yeah. Well, so that's interesting. $360,000 raised against, $254,000 raised for. So it's at, this, one's, this one's way closer than the Slaughterhouse Band. Who's raising the money for? Are the same people. The like Animal the, Futures the, the, the Animal Foundations, vegan, vegan activist types. Okay, well, let's go on to the next one, which is our oh, last one. Betting. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Margins, margins on uh, the fan. Fifty-three uh, percent pass. Pass. Okay, Paul. Honestly, deep, you kind of convinced me on this one. I, I was thinking this was going to go down, but now I think. I mean, if these other places are doing, what do you think, Patty? I think it's going down, but it's going to be very tight. 
I think what you brought up deep about like California and European countries doing this made me think like, oh yeah, wouldn't we want to be on that? Wouldn't we want to be a part of that? Like we're, we're moving past things. But I also think Denver still doesn't want to be, Denverites don't want to be told what they have to do. They want to be independent. That's That's a Colorado thing too. You want to, and I don't think there's been a good campaign against this to point out this is not a homegrown movement. Yeah, that part too is also interesting because that comes into play with the I, I don't know as well. if I buy that, Patty. To yeah. be honest, I talked to a lot of these uh, these pro animal future people. Yeah, a lot of them are from out of town. A lot of them are from here too. Yeah, well, I talked to the one who went and said that in front of the Colorado Restaurant Association. Really, they yeah, said so, they were mm-hmm. they were too. There were a lot of them. They from were out both of town. from out of town. Yeah. Hmm. Well. Well, okay, let's talk about the last one, I guess, which is Measure 309, ban slaughterhouses and city limits. This would ban the operation, construction, and use of slaughterhouses and city limits beginning 2026. This would currently impact one lone existing slaughterhouse, Superior Farms in Globeville. I'm going to throw to my producer, Paul, because he... Oh, hold on. Paul's texting second. his wife. Hold Sorry. On. No, I'm not. No, 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 no. I, I'm kidding. <laughs> so I, when I first thought of this one, I was like, oh, my God. The Paul whole, the whole city is going to vote on, on one. one business. Are you kidding me? We're going to talk about one business. And so I consulted uh, one of my favorite sources, um, a man whose uh, knowledge of Denver history is encyclopedic. You can ask Phil Goodstein about any street address in the city, and he'll say, oh, yeah, this family owned it in that place. It's just a house in Park Hill. He'll tell you about this. So I emailed him when this fir- I first saw this come up, and I said, hey, what's the deal with this slaughterhouse? Do you know anything about this? And he said, I do not know much about the specific slaughterhouse. He didn't, no one knew about this thing. No one knew it existed. I have to be honest, I didn't know it existed here until this uh, measure. They knew, no one knew about it, and now we all know everything about it. Like, I know how much the people get paid. I know how, how what, well, I don't know what their turnover rate is because they refuse to say it. They refuse to say how, how big it is, maybe 200%. And Paul went down to maybe the slaughterhouse 300%. And- Went on a tour. I don't know. I, Patty, I, we haven't talked about this in a while. I know you get a lot of press releases from the animal people. <laughs> it's so... They are very annoying. It's like being 1985 again, because everyone is sending letters to the editor, not even realizing no one runs letters to the editor anymore. You know, So it's endless. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm sending another op-ed about the slaughterhouse. I'm like, please don't. We've run two in favor of the slaughterhouse ban, two against... We're kind of done. If they could just merge the mountain lion proposal with the the slaughterhouse, like no more slaughtering of mountain lions in Denver, it would save me so much time. (laughs) Because that is the only other measure people are talking about as much. So we're voting against it because they annoyed the shit out of Patty. I want to give them a little credit, too. Yeah, I was going to say, Paul, you really dug into this on both sides. I I also talked to their like strategic person, Aiden, uh, who's the head of the Pro Animal Future Group, and he was like, We've really changed our strategy, you know, within the animal welfare community. They used to do a lot of direct action, like, you know, getting naked and interrupting sports events and stuff. Um, And he used to do this. You know, he doesn't like to talk about it, but he did this once to a Kamala Harris event. He ran on stage and interrupted her speech. Um, Naked? Not naked. Not naked. (laughs) He did have, he said he had a slogan on his t-shirt, but he wouldn't tell me what the slogan he, was. He wasn't wearing fur though, that's for sure. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not Definitely fur. not. But they don't do that anymore. They don't try to scold people into it. So this like direct democracy thing, I think it's really refreshing from the animal future, animal welfare people. Now we're talking about jobs. Now we're talking about what ra- what what conditions are in factory farms. This is a so much more productive conversation and we get to talk about the details. now. But both sides are talking about jobs, which I think is interesting. Deep, what do you think? I think, you know, if they, just like how you were saying, I think a lot of people didn't know there was a slaughterhouse in Denver. And my knee-jerk reaction was like, oh, well, I went to Fort Collins for college, Colorado State University. And I feel like whenever I think of a slaughterhouse, I think of like when the wind's blowing into Fort Collins, CSU students would say a lot of mean things. Right. And I, I think in my head, I was like, oh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have slaughterhouses in Denver, right? So the no campaign, I think is fighting an uphill battle in terms of the maybe the natural nimbyism of people, right? And when I talked to the pro-animal future people, I said, you know, I think your winning message is actually, I don't want a slaughterhouse in my backyard. Like, you wouldn't want a slaughterhouse in Wash Park. You wouldn't want a slaughterhouse in Hilltop. You wouldn't want a slaughterhouse in Cherry Creek, maybe where that Bed Bath & Beyond is. 
Like you wouldn't want it there. So why why give one to Globeville, which is one of the more poor neighborhoods, right? I think if you ran on that message, I think you would pass. But instead, I, I think they're like, no, we want to like you know we don't we want to fight fair. We want to talk about animals. We want to talk about worker conditions. And for that reason, I don't think it's going to pass. But if Denver voters read it and they're like, no slaughterhouses in my backyard, done. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's an interesting perspective. I, the, the the whistleblower that the um, the the activist had. This is a guy who used to work at this particular slaughterhouse before it was owned by Superior Farms. It used to be a place called Denver Lamb that owned it, and this was his point. He was like, "I got involved with these activists. They invited me into their campaign um, because the smell. It's disgusting. I grew up in Globeville, and I hate it." You know, he, he also doesn't eat lamb after having worked there and like gone through the process of carving up these lambs every day in this tedious, you know, mind numbing. Some people, for some people, traumatic, you know, carving up carcasses. Um, but for him, it was this smell. At least that's what he said to me. And like, I, I, I think this is a really good point about the NIMBYism, but I don't think that's how people are going to see it. Well, we're not voting against Purina, which is another one. I mean, that's one of the odd things when you say it's just this one business. Oh, and there have been plenty of businesses that have really tainted Globeville over the years. Yeah, we're, talking we're not Suncor, doing Suncor. We're, talking, right. we're not doing Purina. We're just doing this one. So they kind of have to stick with the lambs. You know, I had a Pueblo elected official comment on my a tweet about the um, slaughterhouse. And he's like, you know, if Denver shuts it down, Pueblo would be gladly take it, right? I'm like, if you rent that ballot measure, like Denver closes the slaughterhouse. Send the slaughterhouse to Pueblo. I think like, it passes okay. like 90%. You know, like, oh, we're helping out Pueblo. Oh, that's great. But well, like, I love Pueblo for the yeah. record. No, well, I love it too. That's why they need jobs down there. Just, or, you know. or by the Gaylord. It'd be perfect. Oh my God. <laughs> so, yeah, I, it's going to be interesting how Denver reads this. I mean, the, I think the no campaign, the reason why so much money came into it, I think that they probably got polling back where the knee-jerk reaction was like, I don't want a slaughterhouse. So they had to do this huge education campaign about this one thing. Yeah, they they were uh, they were really smart about it. I, I they uh, Superior Farms sponsored the Denver Food and Wine Festival, um, which we got because they were sponsored on the show. We got some tickets, so I was there and I, I saw the kiosk where the people were there and it happened to be the woman who was running the campaign, Mar Maria Garcia Barry, Barry who, who is like a long time, long super time, powerful super powerful inside, lobbyist, CRL Associates. CRL Associates. She was a little bit tipsy at the Denver Food and Wine Fest. So Paul did, stuck a microphone I, in her face. And I, it was great. And she said exactly that. She was like, I think a lot of people would think, why are slaughterhouses in Denver anyway? Get rid of it. But then she was like, workers. This is about workers. This is about the neighborhood. This is about jobs. How can you vote to take away 160 jobs from people who want to do these jobs? And that's what they've been campaigning on the whole time. And I think that's going to be persuasive for people. You know, they've got these really, really glitzy, glamorous ads showcasing like, oh, a person grew up in Globeville, live, lived there for their whole life. Their family worked at Superior Farms. Now they work at Superior Farms and they're an employee owner, which again, they refuse to tell me how many people who work at the plant qualify for that program. But they're an employee owner and that sounds too good to vote against. Well, that's their best argument. And they Strong. also... And they started out promoting, they were the sponsor of uh, Denver Restaurant Week, too, mm -hmm. back at the in, beginning of March. And they had a big event up at CSU Spur, if you've been up there, by National Western. And if you're ever going to be at a place where a slaughterhouse makes sense, I mean, you're in the pens. You're in the area that really is based on agriculture and produce and meat. And it looks great, but they have to push the employees. And the guy who runs the place started crying about all his employees and all those little lambs and how nice they are to them. But you have to push, you have to push the employees because that's their only winning argument. And plus, we don't want voters to tell, I mean, if you could vote against one business, I would say, like, vote to make the Cherry Cricket hamburgers half the price. If we're really going to tell what businesses <laughs> should be doing, that's a little weird. One business is effective. But again, this is a temperature thing, right, is how I took it, is they're oh, testing absolutely. Denverites to see if this is something that could get further and further maybe across the yeah. state. I mean, but the how activists don't said that. They said the state's the next move. Sure. They would, they would love to be running this campaign against JBS and Greeley. You know, what's interesting is like, you know, if they also focused, and they do really care about animal rights, and I think they're being very creative about how to put animal rights first. Um, you know, I, I'm Indian, and a lot of Indians are vegetarian. I grew up in a vegetarian household. Um, it's much easier to be vegetarian when you're Indian because the food's delicious. So I don't blame the white folks. The only <laughs> seasoning you put on is on your meat. 
Um, no offense, sorry. Um, I love garlic, okay? Yes, garlic's huge. It's maybe a spice even. Um, no, what I was going to say is, uh, you know, one of the talk things to you about think, this later, after. One of the things they've talked about is, uh, you know, passing a sunshine requirement, right? Denver's 300 days of sunshine. And saying that, like, you know, all animals that are slaughtered in Colorado deserve that sunshine too. They deserve outside time. They need to be outside for four or five hours, which is so contrary to some slaughterhouses that it would maybe bankrupt them, right? So I don't think this is the last time you'll actually see these folks, right? That they'll come back. And one of the things is the heat map of the vote on this is going to be really interesting, right? Yes. If Globeville comes out and they wanted it closed, but the rest of the city's like, nah, you got to keep it. That's going to feel weird. I, I was up there. I was up there with my colleague, Adrian Gonzalez, who works at CityCast with us. We, we talked to a bunch of people. He speaks Spanish, so we got people to, you know, really talk to us. 50-50. 50-50. We talked to like 15 people. I, just have, I struggle with the worker conversation part of it because on the, the no side of it, all the op-eds and stuff I'm seeing are from chefs, which is like, cool, I guess. But these are not the folks that are doing that work. That's so brutal and like psychologically. I don't know, Paul, you went to the plant. I want, I want to say one more thing about the workers because no one is talking about this yet. And your point, Deep, is so on point about we're not talking about maybe, maybe, maybe not banning the plant, but maybe like regulating how animals are treated would be a better, more productive conversation that more people have are to do with interested in. But the workers is the right. same situation. Right. The workers is like Workers, do they have jobs or not? Black and white. But what I've learned from talking to a lot of current and former workers is that Superior Farms for at least 20, at least 30 years has had a reputation in the neighborhood for hiring undocumented workers. And that I talked to three specific people who said they were treated poorly and used that, their immigration status against them to treat them worse. And I think... That's a conversation we should be having around this slaughterhouse. If we want to talk about jobs, we should talk about the people that do these jobs, that work at these slaughterhouses. It's a problem at JBS, too. Oh, my it's gosh. It's a huge Absolutely. problem in the whole slaughterhouse industry. This is widely documented. And, like, yeah, why are these the jobs that folks are only able so to have? So why haven't we heard that about this slaughterhouse? I, I have no idea. I have no idea. The activists are talking about it. It's not their main thing. They care about the animals. But they, they I mean, I haven't verified this. Superior Farms denies this, for the record. They say, we do not hire undocumented people to work at the plant, and we treat everybody we, we, we work with equally. But I talked to three people that all said this. They said, we were threatened, we were bullied, we were treated poorly, injuries happened regularly, we didn't have access to health care we wanted, and we left for those reasons. That's why I find that argument so disingenuous from these people that are against it because they're not those folks. They're not the folks working in the actual conditions that like that to me is like, I don't want to read an editorial from a chef because you're not doing that job. Like it's just, it just feels disingenuous to me. I mean, the whole meat industry runs on this. Right. Like I, right. there was this great article in New Yorker from this, this reporter who's been writing about the meat industry for years and years, Ted Genoways. And he was like, Donald Trump wants to deport undocumented workers. Okay. That would destroy the meat supply in this country. Like JBS could not run without undocumented workers. That is, it is, it is a fundamental thing. And then we're talking about working conditions, you know, because like the immigration process and you know these sorts of like regulations allow us to maintain certain standards for jobs and safety. And if we can't do that, if everything is off the books and in this weird wishy-washy area, then people get treated poorly. And then it's just a human-to-human -human issue. You know, and that's that's what this industry relies on. It, you know, I think this is like round one, season one of this argument. Yeah. You know, we're cursed to talk about golf courses in Denver for the rest of forever. I'm going to take you outside. And now, now we also will talk about slaughterhouses, I yeah. think, for a long time, right? I mean, depending on the vote margin, if this is in the 40s for the pro-animal future, even if they lose, I think that gives a signal that like, wow, if we modify the message, if you go after something mm -hmm. else— Maybe they come back. It's such it's such a smart strategy from the animal people. You just you just have to give them credit because the scolding thing didn't work. No, nobody likes it. I was a vegetarian for twelve years. I hated it. I hated these people <laughs> telling me I should stop <laughs> drinking milk. Horrible. But when you put people, this I have to give. I wish I could give credit to the person who told me this, but he asked to remain anonymous. But it was a, a state representative who put this so smartly. He said. Put people in a citizen mindset. If you get people to think about what 
is best for their community and what is best for their, their country, they're going to make better decisions than they would for themselves. Maybe they'll eat meat and they'll recognize their own hypocrisy and they'll love eating that steak, but then they won't care. But if you get them to think about the effect on the broader community and you put, them, it, put it in the ballot and you make, put it in the, uh, make it a vote, then they'll think about it differently and you might have a change. I yeah. think it's such a huge change for this whole movement. And that, that I, that's, that's news here for, for this vote. I, I don't know if it's going to pass, though. Yeah, let's do margins. This is our last one. 46.72. Does not pass. Wait, wait, 40.672? 46. 46. 46.72. Percent. Someone writing this down. So it's gonna. you think it's going to go down? I think it's going to go down by a small margin. Okay. But I think that's where the opportunity is to do it again. Okay. Patty, what do you think? I agree. I think it's going down maybe by a slightly larger margin, but it'll really depend. We've got over two weeks, if someone actually came out and did the story, can get on the record how the workers are treated, not just the undercover, but if there are violations on file, mm-hmm. which you'd think we'd have heard by now. I don't I don't have violations. Yeah. I don't have a smoking gun on this. I don't have any like documentary proof of like specific violations did of Danielle labor Juritsky laws. Did Danielle Juritsky tell you that? That they were uh, <laughs> undocumented workers? Yeah, Please don't no, make us talk about Danielle Juritsky. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, I mean, it's real. I, I talked to three people. They all said this one couple, this, they told me she, she had an injury on, on, on the job. She said she was directed to a healthcare facility that did not give her the care that she wanted. And she requested to have access to a different place. And then she was let go from her job. Oh. Okay. No union. I just, it's, the people who are fighting JBS, I mean, what's interesting is they don't want to get rid of it. Most of them. I know that's they the want, other thing. That they want to just have better worker conditions. So why aren't they talking about it here? I don't know. Yeah, the local seven, what is it, the UFCW, they represent mm-hmm. the folks up in, in JBS. They, they're on the no campaign. They were on the steps of the of the city and county build, building running against this. They're trying to keep this place issue. open. Yeah. yeah, the interesting question is, if this passes, how does the meat industry in Colorado and nationwide change? Mm-hmm. At all. I don't know. I don't know. There's so much to this issue that's so fat that we haven't touched. Like this is a halal facility. Some people know what that means exactly, but a lot of people don't. Like there are three people on staff at Superior Farms that are allowed to do the actual slaughtering. Muslim workers who have to do a very specific type of like killing of these lambs. I don't. I don't know if people know that. It's it's very highly regulated, and it's part of this religion. You know. I, I that's what we're voting on. That's so weird. I, I'm not, I don't want to judge this. This is not for me to say. Well, I'm getting And this also in. gets into the rural urban issue again. Yeah. It's like wolves. It's the to- I was thinking the, the same people- thing. It's like the wolves vote. Yeah. But it's just in Denver right now. So we can't really look at that differentiation between urban and rural. No, but that will yet. be one of the things yeah. that we see. And I'm sorry to bring up Aurora again. But at the Trump rally where they're. They actually are like, we don't want Denver to run this state anymore. And you're like, hey, I just drove five miles across the border to get here. You know, but the rural, the hate for Denver is real. And this would really, if it passes, we're going to see a bigger an division. An interesting Boy, message sent. That's yeah. an interesting point. I think you're right. Okay. Well, uh, this is it, you guys. Did I say it's going to fail yet? No, I think it's t- going to go down. You think it's going to go down What's by your margin? what? 60-40. Oh, oh, wow, okay. 60 40, it's going to go down. Okay. Patty? It's going to go down, but it'll be closer than that. Okay. And no one would have predicted that six months ago. Okay, well, thank you all. This was lovely. Thank you all, our audience. You guys are great. Thank you. This was so fun. Uh, we'll be around for a little while after if you want to chat. Um, we'll be covering more of the ballot on CityCast Denver. You can always read Westward as well. There's going to be tons of coverage coming. I mean, what do we have, two weeks left? It'll be interesting to see what changes. Um, but I just want to thank uh, the crew here at Town Hall Collaborative, Denise and Warren. Thank you so much. Um, our sound dude, Matt. Um, our volunteers tonight, Clay, Casey, and Emily. And uh, and all of you. Thanks yeah, again for showing up. Give it up for up. yourself. Yeah, give this was awesome. Yourself. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for coming. Every breathe, please. Breathe, Davies, everybody. Every breathe, every breathe. Every breathe. Every Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks.
That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell a firefighter about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you later. So shared some predictions. My bad. Dyslexia. Okay.